So again, my name is Dr. Modlin. I'm a urologist. I'm a kidney transplant surgeon at Cleveland Clinic. And my topic today is a discussion in terms of why race matters in health and healthcare. And over the course of my conversation, I hope to be able to prove to you why I assert that an individual's race should matter in terms of how physicians recommend preventative health care for given individuals. Race should matter in terms of how physicians and health care providers approach the treatment of disease in given individuals. And, and also, race in health care should matter in terms of how scientific researchers and investigators decide and implement their medical research for the innovation of new medical therapies, including pharmaceutical uh, medications. So my topic, race matters in healthcare. These are my parents, uh, Charles and, and Grace Modlin. I want to basically first tell you a, a story in, in terms of why I'm so passionate about this, this topic and how I basically dedicated the last 13 years of my career, in addition to urology and, and kidney transplantation, to addressing special health care concerns regarding race and health care. I want to relate a true story which really highlights my motivation to engage in this work. It was back in 2003. I had a very uh, busy day in the operating room. It was very cold outside, much like today. I had two patients on my OR schedule, operating room schedule, uh, two men with prostate cancer. I was scheduled to perform radical prostatectomies. I was finishing up my first operation around 9.30 in the morning, and the phone rang in the operating room. The operating room nurse answered the phone and immediately called out to me, Dr. Modlin, you need to take this phone call. There's an emergency phone call from your office. It's your secretary calling. Your secretary has an urgent phone call from your mother's doctor back in Indiana. I was still in my sterile gown and gloves and I rushed over to the telephone. A, mil a million things uh, were going through my mind, wondering what was happening to my mother. Why was her doctor calling me? Was she okay? You see, five days earlier, my mother had actually undergone a lower extremity amputation, a lower extremity amputation due to severe complications from diabetes and kidney failure. And she was currently in an ICU down at a hospital in, in Indiana. She was actually scheduled to have her remaining leg amputated later that week, uh, and I was going to drive down four and a half hours to be with her. I was at her bedside the, during the uh, previous uh, operation, and I was going to drive back down and be with her uh, for the next operation. So as I got to the phone, the nurse held the telephone to my ear as I was in my sterile uh, gloves and, and gown, and I could hear her doctor tell me, Dr. Modlin, your mother just had a cardiac arrest. She suffered from ventricular tachycardia, but we cardioverted her. And I interrupted the doctor. I said, okay, I'm gonna cancel my second patient's operation. I'm gonna drive down to Indiana. I can be down there in about four hours to be at my mother's bedside. And the doctor stopped me. He goes, that's not gonna be necessary. You don't have to cancel your second patient's surgery. Stay where you are. Your mother's stable. Her blood pressure and pulse are stable. She's all right. And upon hearing that, I felt immediate relief, and, and so I continued with my schedule. I started my second patient's operation. As I was finishing up my second patient's operation around 3.30 in the afternoon, the telephone rang in the operating room again. Again, it was my mother's doctor from Indiana calling, and this time over the phone I could hear him say, Dr. Modlin, your mother suffered another cardiac arrest. I'm sorry to have to tell you we were not able to revive her and she passed away at 3.02 p.m. Well, I was devastated to hear this news. I was very remorseful and, and sad, but at the same time I felt immediate anger towards myself. And I felt this anger because I had not canceled my second patient's operation and I knew had I canceled that operation, I would have had time to drive down to Indiana to be with my mother during her last moments of life. And I couldn't understand how I could ever forgive myself for not being there in her time of need. I felt that I had let her down. And, and what's worse, 
as a physician, I felt that had I been sitting at her bedside, perhaps I might have noticed something on the EKG monitor to where I could have alerted her nurses and doctors before she developed a second cardiac arrest. I was very devastated and I decided to go home, get some rest, and my plan was to drive down to Indiana the next day to make her final preparations. However, during that night, as I was tossing and turning in bed trying to get some sleep, in the wee hours of the morning, I heard something that was very strange and inexplicable. I heard the chiming and the ticking of a clock which hung high on the wall downstairs in my house. But what was very strange is that this clock had actually not worked for more than six months. Nobody had actually wound the clock because it hadn't worked. It hadn't been wound probably for four months or, or, or longer. I looked at my bedside clock and it read 3.02 a.m. And so I just really couldn't understand how or why that clock could be ticking downstairs. And so the next morning as I descended the stairs, I looked over and that clock was still ticking. The hands on the clock read 3.02. And it suddenly occurred to me what was happening and why. What was happening was that my mother had sent me a message from beyond telling me that, son, you did the right thing by staying and taking care of your patients. Don't worry about me. You, don't, you should not blame yourself for not being here with me. You did the right thing by taking care of your patients and staying in Cleveland. And when I realized what had happened and the message that she had sent me, a calmness came over my entire being because I realized that she had sent me a message in terms of what the reason I was put here on earth to do, and it was to not only take care of individual patients, but also to innovate ways in which to provide comfort and care for those in need on a larger scale. <coughs> this is a picture of the clock, and the story that I related to you was a true story, and in fact, that clock continued to run unwound for the next four months. <coughs> so my mother had actually, in a sense, given me real instructions in a, in a marching order in terms of what I needed to do in life. And what I interpreted that to do was to develop a special program at Cleveland Clinic dedicated to serving special populations, which I will go into more detail about. In fact, Dr. Martin Luther King was quoted as saying, our lives begin to end the day we remain silent about things that matter. And to me, this initiative that I started at, at Cleveland Clinic, my medical institution, was something that really was important to me and mattered to society <coughs> because it represents a growing crisis in America that many of, uh, many of you, many Americans, have not heard of that exists. It's a growing crisis that actually threatens the uh, very existence of our population and our overall nation's productivity and existence. It's a crisis that I venture to guess that many of you have not heard discussed on the national news. It has not been discussed, as far as I know, on 60 Minutes. You haven't heard it discussed during any of the recent presidential debates, but it's a real growing crisis that I have actually become a leading voice in terms of raising awareness and trying to find solutions to eliminate this crisis. I wanted to show you the change in demographics in terms of population in the United States over the past 40 years. In 1970, 12% of the U.S. population was represented by minorities. Currently, minorities constitute about 30 or 40 percent of the population. By the year 2050, minorities will become the majority. This is very important because we can see that the demographics in America represent the fact that we have a growing diversity in the United States. But this growing diversity in the United States relates to the crisis of which I speak. And why is that? The crisis of which I speak is related to health disparities. Now, I'm not sure how many of you have actually heard of this crisis of health disparities or know what health care disparities represent, but health care disparities represent a disproportionate burden of disease experienced by certain 
populations, namely racial and ethnic minorities in the United States, and it's represented by some of these higher rates of disease, hypertension, um, which is uh, disproportionately higher in minorities, diabetes, heart disease, kidney disease, cancers, and many other conditions. The healthcare disparities, in, in fact, contribute to the fact that even though the lifespans of Americans are increasing uh, with time, the differential lifespans between majority populations and minorities is represented by the fact that African Americans generally have a six to eight year shorter life expectancy compared to their Caucasian American counterparts. So I wanted to not only highlight some examples of the healthcare disparities, the crisis in which I speak, but I also wanted to highlight some of the causes of these healthcare disparities, and there are many. Some of the causes relate to lack of access to quality care that many minorities have, unequal treatment that many minorities experience at the hands of physicians and healthcare providers, stereotyping and bias uh, of healthcare providers when it comes to the race or ethnicity of a given patient, deficiencies in, in communication skills and cultural competency of healthcare providers which relate and cause poor patient adherence and compliance, health literacy deficiencies on part of patients, historical distrust that many minorities have when it comes to seeking health care from physicians or healthcare institutions, other social determinants of health, lack of minority participation in clinical research and hereditary and genetic factors, and lack of diversity in medicine and the subspecialization of medicine are some of the factors that I've studied over the past number of years and determined are many of the determinants of the healthcare disparities, the crisis in which I speak. Now, we've all heard the speech from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. when he said, my dream is that one day my four children, little children, will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. And I know that we all agree with this statement. But Dr. Martin Luther King was well aware of the fact that minorities suffer disproportionately a burden of disease incidence compared to majority populations when he was saying of all the injustices and equities in healthcare are the most shocking and the most inhumane. He knew the fact that minorities had a disproportionate burden of disease and that race and healthcare should in fact be a consideration when doctors consider how patients should be treated. Even though there's a minimal difference in terms of the genetic makeup between the races, I assert that the genetic differences are enough along with the social determinants of health to cause the differential incidence of disease in minority populations. And I assert that race should be used as a surrogate marker for the incidence or the likelihood of certain diseases occurring in given individuals. So uh, as I said, doctors should consider race in disease prevention, treatment, and research. So what are some of, some of the ways in which that we can address and eliminate these healthcare disparities? Well, we need to educate healthcare providers about the phenomenon of healthcare disparities. As was mentioned in the previous talk, doctors and healthcare providers need to be better at listening and communicating uh, with racial and ethnic minorities. We need to assume, uh, assemble a teamwork of volunteers uh, to go out and serve the communities in these minority populations. We need to build trust within minority communities so that they'll be, they'll be more willing to come in to undergo um, health screenings. We need to provide and develop facilitated health access programs. We need to promote and assist patients in terms of navigating into the healthcare system. And we need to partner with influential community leaders so patients will follow through with our treatment recommendations. We need to educate patients about health literacy and how they need to better take care of themselves. And we need, need to actually perform hands-on patient care for these minority populations. And we need to empower minority populations to take action to improve their own health status. Another thing we need to do is to encourage more minorities to participate in clinical research and researchers to investigate the pathogenesis of, of healthcare disparities. And we need to partner 
with our uh, corporate uh, partners so that we'll, they'll invest more in terms of research and healthcare disparity programming. Another thing we need to do is elect governmental officials who will be more concerned and interested in addressing elimination of healthcare disparities, and this is very important. And we also need to promote the diversity in the healthcare workforce. This is just a picture of, of me in the OR uh, with uh, some high school students that are sh were shadowing me. These strategies in terms of eliminating healthcare disparities, if we com combine these strategies simultaneously, I assert that we will eliminate health disparities and avert this crisis which is actually threatening the very existence of our nation. The main message that I was taught from my parents was to be persistent in these efforts and to never give up. That's my father, Charles Modlin Sr. He actually holds four gold medals in the National Sen Senior Games Association for men over 80 in track and field. And again, together, we can eliminate these healthcare disparities. The choice is ours. You don't have to be a physician, a healthcare provider, a Nobel Prize winning scientist to get involved to play a major role, a significant role in terms of eliminating health disparities. We can all play a role and we should all play a role. One thing that each and every one of us can do is to educate the community about the fact that healthcare disparities exist, to educate the community about the importance of undergoing preventative health screenings for the early detection of disease. We can all play a role in terms of reducing the incidence of stereotyping individuals. We can help stamp out racism, homelessness. There are many things that we can do. Together, we can see an end to the health care disparities, which is a crisis which is threatening the very existence of our nation. Thank you.